we're going to hear Father Fenton shortly. Maybe we'll take a, about a 10-minute break. Father Fenton, I don't think, will be speaking for more than 45 minutes. So a uh, 10-minute break, and then please come back in promptly so that we can tape him as well. Thank you. In his activity for the traditional Mass, actually since 1972 or 73, if I'm not mistaken, and what I have especially admired in him is that you always knew where he stood. <laughs> Which I'm sure you know if you have been following the traditional movement over the years that that is a quality that we cannot say of a, a number of people who have taken positions. That, that we have seen a great deal of moving about from from one position to another and all kinds of fuzziness and excuses for sound theology. And uh, Father Fenton has always been very, very clear and straightforward in all of the positions that he has taken, and I admire him for that. And so it is my pleasure to give you this veteran of the traditional mass apostolate and battle, Father Francis Fenton. Thank you, Father Sanborn, Father Kelly, Father McMahon, gentlemen. Before the actual talk, they're not going to play that tape until I actually get to the talk itself. Just two uh, announcements or comments here. Uh, one, I have copies of two, a number of copies of two recent issues of the newsletter that that uh, our TCA uh, publishes, the Athanasian. Uh, a number of you men already subscribe to it, but a number do not. And um, these are the issues. Uh, of January and uh, March 1st, I think. It comes out every eight weeks, anyway. And uh, they're here for the taking, uh, plus a subscription envelope. Now, uh, what I would ask you to do is to take one or another. One copy features the article on, on the Assisi meeting of John Paul II, and the title, I think, is clever. I can say that because it's not, I didn't write the article. Uh, uh, Assisi, the Conciliar Church's pagan love song. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the other features, there are several articles in each issue, but the other features uh, the incredible creed of the Mormons. Uh, and uh, we're very proud of this newsletter, worked very hard at it, certainly. And so I would ask you to take uh, one or another copy and a subscription envelope. And if, uh, uh, if all of them are not taken after everyone takes one who wants one, then you could take a copy of the, of the second article, too. And then, then you would just read them. And if you think you'd like to subscribe, then the information is on the subscription envelope. And just uh, uh, send in the subscription and, uh, or give it to me here. And then uh, you will be, your subscription would start then with the upcoming issue, uh, which um, uh, will be mailed out, God willing, this Wednesday. It'll be the, um, it'll be the, uh, the issue of, of, June, of June the 1st. So that's all I've got to say about that. Uh, and... Um, the only other thing I would say is the, uh, most of you recognize the name, but you never met the man, so, uh, and he'll probably never forgive me for this, but John Weiskittle, just stand up so I'll know who you are. Where are you? There he is now there in the back. <laughs> okay. Uh, more and more, it's getting to be... I should call it the Weisskiller Report <laughs> rather than the Athanasian because my articles are becoming fillers <laughs> for, for John's articles. And the upcoming issue now, the two articles, yes, two shorter articles, um, and um, one is the other side of Thomas Jefferson, and the other one is the news media and secret societies. So both of those are, as he always writes, they're very, very informative, and uh, he has a uh, great genius at research. So much for that. I don't want to embarrass John anymore. So then, um, 
I'll proceed with my talk and just wait for a moment till you're... <coughs> Onward, Christian soldiers. Of the literally billions of people who have inhabited the earth since the dawn of human history, one person stands out above all others. No one ever spoke as he spoke. No one ever made and incontrovertibly confirmed with miracles the claims which he made. No one before him or since has left a more indelible mark upon the world. No one has had a more profound effect upon the lives of multitudes over the last 19 and a half centuries. Although most of his life was lived in relative obscurity, and although he was put to death in the manner of a common criminal of those days, his was the greatest life ever lived, and his death and resurrection the most significant events in the history of the world. That person we know was Jesus Christ, whom we believe to be God as well as man, the Word incarnate, the second person of the Blessed Trinity in human form. Indeed, the entirety of the faith we profess stands or falls upon this belief of ours, the divinity of Jesus Christ. Though he be the greatest man who ever throbbed the earth, though he taught the most beautiful and sublime doctrine the world has ever heard, though his life and teachings exerted an unparalleled, a unique influence upon the human race, yet if Christ be not God, our faith is devoid of its very foundation, and the Roman Catholic Church is essentially no different from hundreds of other religious bodies around the world. But we believe and we know that Christ was and is God, and we worship and adore him as such. As a matter of fact, so strong, so unshakable is our belief in this most fundamental truth of our faith, that with the grace of God, we would readily sacrifice life itself rather than to deny it. Further, as Catholics, we believe that God, in the person of his divine Son, became like unto us in all things but sin, in order to atone for the sins of the world and to reopen for man the gates of heaven. By his life, passion, and death, the Son of God regained for us the indispensable means to attain heaven, which had been lost through original sin. Through his teachings, he showed us the path to follow, what we must believe, and how we must live in order one day to realize the ultimate purpose for which we were created, the perfect happiness of heaven, the eternal union with God, the beatific vision. It follows then that the only sensible, reasonable way for a man to live his earthly life is with an eye ever on eternity. To be ever aware that the supreme goal of his sojourn on this earth is the glorious kingdom of heaven and hence to live accordingly. If one succeeds in attaining that goal, his life has been a resounding success. If one fails in this, his life has been an utter, total, irredeemable failure. How essential, therefore, in view of the fact that Christ was God and that man's eternal destiny is dependent upon the acceptance of Christ's teachings, how absolutely imperative it becomes that all men of all time be able to acquire with certainty a knowledge of those vital truths taught by the Son of God during the course of his earthly life. And if belief in the body of doctrine Christ preached and obedience to the code of morality he enunciated, if these are necessary for man's sanctification and salvation, then it follows, as surely as night follows day, that the Son of God must have made every provision to guarantee that his teachings would be preserved pure and entire until the end of time. It is simply inconceivable that he would not have done so. That guarantee was and is the Roman Catholic Church built up during Christ's earthly life, completed on the cross, and which began to function on the first Pentecost Sunday. The same Catholic Church which exists and functions in the world today in traditional Catholicism and which will be and which will so continue until the end of time. The church of which you and I, whether by birth or through the grace of conversion, are privileged to be members. The visible continuation in the world of Christ 
and the work of sanctification and redemption which he began nearly 2,000 years ago. The Catholic Church of the 20th century then is the same society of which the apostles and disciples of the first century were, were members and with which Christ promised that he would remain all days until the end of the world. It is the same organization against which he guaranteed that the forces of evil would never prevail and which would be infallible in preserving and in teaching the eternal truths that he had committed to it. It is the same Catholic Church in testimony to his God-given faith literally millions of our fellow Catholics have shed their life's blood in martyrdom all down through the 20 centuries of the Christian era. It is the kingdom of God upon earth which, like its divine founder, and in accordance with his prediction, has been slandered and persecuted since his birth, and which nonetheless lives on and on, despite the most violent hostility and antagonism from even its bitterest and most determined enemies. It is the mystical body of Christ in the world today, applying to its members the infinite merits and graces gained by the physical body of Christ upon the cross of Calvary. Among all religious bodies on the face of the earth, the Roman Catholic Church is unique because it alone is the one true church of the Son of God, the one organization in all the world whose credentials are incontestably divine, whose claims and teachings bear the solemn ratification of none other than God himself. The greatness, the grandeur, the glory of the Roman Catholic Church across the years and down through the centuries, all is indelibly written in the annals of history. Countless men, women, boys and girls in all walks of life have led lives of extraordinary sanctity within its fold. Untold millions of non-Catholics have been converts to it. Many of the greatest minds and keenest intellects the world has ever known have been Roman Catholics. As Roman Catholics then, we belong to the one organization on the face of the globe established by the Son of God for the eternal salvation of mankind. In that church, the revealed word of God is found in all its beauty. The moral law of God is preached in its entirety. Sins are forgiven to the truly repentant in the sacrament of penance. The body and blood of Christ are received in the blessed sacrament of the Eucharist. The sacrifice of the cross is renewed daily in the unbloody sacrifice of the Mass. As Catholics, we have the greatest thing in God's world, the Roman Catholic faith. Membership in the one true Church of Christ so tremendous a treasure indeed that in the words of Pope Pius XII nothing more glorious, nothing nobler, nothing surely more ennobling can be imagined than to belong to the Holy Catholic, Apostolic and Roman Church. And so it follows that if our Catholicism is so high and lofty a privilege and the treasures of the Church so precious and so priceless, it follows that the clear-cut duty of every Catholic worthy of the name is to live in accordance with the dignity befitting his membership in the mystical body of Christ and to reflect in his daily life the sublime faith which he professes. Because we are Roman Catholics, we are, or we're supposed to be, full-fledged, totally committed followers of Christ. This means, among other things, that our God-given faith is the overriding, supreme, most vital concern of our lives, that the desire to advance steadily in the knowledge and love and service of God is the paramount objective of our daily lives, an objective which we steadfastly refuse to be overshadowed by worldly considerations, material security, social prestige, wealth, fame, power, whatever. It means that Christ is the king of our hearts and souls and that we are witnesses to him and to his church in the world and in the community in which we live. By our words and by our example, we reflect upon our faith for better or for worse. True faith, wrote St. Gregory the Great, true faith consists in this, that we do not contradict by our actions what we profess in words. 
Now, three marks or qualities or traits, I contend, ought to distinguish truly traditional Roman Catholics in general, and in particular, you men of the Vexilla Regis Association. And they are prayer, knowledge, action. First and foremost, you must be men of prayer. By this I refer primarily, of course, to the Mass, the sacraments, the rosary, penitential practices, approved devotions of the Church, and so on. All these, with the Mass and the sacraments having priority, all these should be part and parcel of the spiritual agenda of authentic men of prayer to the extent that the various duties of their state in life permit them. Further, a spirit of prayer should be developed that will in due time permeate and saturate your life so as to transform it into a truly God-centered, Christ-like life in every respect. Such, admittedly, is a big order and calls for strong convictions and determination and persistence. Our apostolate demands men of strong faith and charity and honor and purity and prudence and fortitude and humility, in a word, men of virtue. And without a solid and ardent prayer life, we will not have such men. Putting first things first, then, I urge you to give prayer and all that that includes top priority in your lives. Whatever you do in word or in work, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. St. Paul to the Colossians. However sincere our motives, however lofty our goals, a sound prayer life must be the foundation of all our activity. In the words of Holy Scripture, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. Second in the list of the three essential requirements which you must have is knowledge, primarily knowledge of the faith. To know our religion is an obligation incumbent upon all of us because, I would give three reasons, because one is God-given. And if God saw fit to reveal his divine truth and eternal law, obviously it follows our obligation is to know our faith and to live that revelation. Secondly, we cannot intelligently, intelligently live a way of life or be dedicated to a cause which we do not adequately comprehend. That's elementary. And three, we cannot correct the false notions others may have about the faith or effectively refute attacks upon it or propagate its doctrines if we ourselves are not well informed on the subject. For such reasons then, it is the duty of every traditional Roman Catholic to know his religion, a duty particularly urgent today because of the widespread confusion regarding Catholic doctrinal and moral teachings, a confusion occasioned, at least in large part, by the false teachers of the conciliar church. What does it profit a man if he gain the world and suffer the loss of his soul? What, too, does it profit a Catholic if he be an expert on trivia, if he knows much about umpteen things which don't amount to a hill of beans? And yet, he is an illiterate on matters pertaining to the faith and the intelligent living of that faith. What kind of a scale of values is that? What sense does it make? Oh, I'm not saying that all knowledge of secular or worldly matters is wrong, by no means. But I am saying that when knowledge of and concern for such things so occupy and consume a person's thinking and living as to obscure or debase the very purpose of life, then that person ought to start getting his priorities straight. To the catechism question, why did God make us? The answer given is crystal clear. God made us to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this life, and thereby to be happy with him forever in heaven. In that one simple catechism statement, we have the foundation of the one and only sane and sound philosophy of life, which means anything in the final analysis. 
But to know God as he wills to be known, and thereby truly to love and to serve him, we must know the faith which he has revealed, and which is taught in all of its truth and beauty and fullness and purity in and by the Roman Catholic Church alone. Hence again, the grave obligation we have of knowing our faith, that we may know God, compared to which all other knowledge is vain and hollow and futile. Vanity of vanities, and all is vanity, save in knowing and loving and serving God. And then there is the third item, which I submit is also an essential requirement for any person who would be a Roman Catholic in the full sense of that term. It was back in the early 70s that the traditional Catholic movement started to take any recognizable form. From its early beginning, I had, I guess, taken for granted that those who were or would become a part of that movement would be, well, more or less the cream of Catholicism. After all, I figured these were the people who, by the grace of God, saw the conciliar church for what it was and had the courage of their convictions to refuse to have any part of it. Their beloved church had been gradually and massively infiltrated by its enemies, Freemasonry, Communism, Modernism, Secular Humanism, infiltrated to the extent that as a result another church actually came into being at some point, which, while retaining the name and many of the trappings of the Roman Catholic Church, had ceased to be the real thing. These people well knew, of course, on the word of Christ himself, that the church he founded would remain forever, but they well knew also that this new conciliar church was something else again. And so it became their awesome responsibility under the guidance of the pitiably few uh, truly traditional Catholic clergy who shared their convictions, it became their awesome responsibility to preserve and to defend and to promote the faith until, God willing, and in his own good time, the church would be restored to its former self. Over 15 years have now passed uh, since the traditional Catholic movement made its appearance upon the American scene, and they have been hectic years indeed. As would be expected, the vast generality of Catholics who were and are associated with traditional Catholicism, they have been and they are, from my observation, devout, morally good, industrious, <coughs> pardon me, family-oriented men and women, deeply concerned about the salvation of their own souls and those of their family and close friends. So far, so good, but that's about it. The great majority of these same people have been and are, in varying degrees, miserable failures when it comes to Catholic action. They are infected with what I would call parochialism or provincialism in matters pertaining to the church, by which I mean that they do not see beyond their particular chapel and traditional group. They have a tunnel vision with regard to the faith, with seemingly little or no concern for it outside their own environment. Oh, they likely pray for the church and for its priests and for their fellow Catholics, but as far as being active, militant, zealous, apostolic on, on behalf of the faith, this assuredly they are not. And because most traditional Catholics are so sadly lacking in these essential qualities, they fall far short of what they are supposed to be as Roman Catholics and of what the church expects them to be. Every Roman Catholic worthy of the name has a moral obligation not only to know his religion and to live it in his personal life, but also publicly to promote and to defend and to fight for his faith. This has always been the case, and it is, it is especially so in our day, that the vast majority of traditional Catholics have so woefully failed in the fulfillment of their duty in this matter has been a tremendous disappointment to me over the years, and it continues to be such. Now, I don't think there's any need for me to take the time in this talk to discuss in any detail 
before this audience how bad things are. <laughs> Nationwide and worldwide. I assume that most, if not all of you, are as well aware of the situation as I am. Is not the present utterly decadent condition of this nation due in no small part to the fact that the Roman Catholic Church is no longer a power to be reckoned with on the American scene? Would abortion, homosexuality, sexual promiscuity, drug addiction, drug addiction and all the rest, would these be the satanic scourge they are in America today if vast numbers of the clergy of that church had not abandoned tradition and the ideals of their priesthood? Indeed, would not the USA and the world be in a far less wretched spiritual and moral condition here and now if by some miracle the conciliar church were simply to disappear forthwith from the face of the earth? <laughs> Surely, never before throughout the Christian centuries have the powers of evil, the forces of hell, prevailed more extensively than they do today. Atheism, secular humanism, the grossest immorality of every conceivable kind pervade our nation to an extent that I, for one, could hardly have dreamed possible, say, some 25 years ago. It follows then that there never was a time when there was a more crying need a more desperate urgency for truly effective Christian counteraction than there is today. If God and his revealed truth and his moral law are to become the dominant force and influence in the minds and hearts and souls of men and among the leaders and in the councils of nations, if Christian culture and a Christian civilization are ever to be restored, all this can only come about through one organization the Roman Catholic Church. There is no other solution. There is no other answer. But with the true church reduced to but a remnant in its membership, how is this seemingly insurmountable task to be accomplished? Why, by Roman Catholics, of course. Roman Catholics who are thoroughly imbued with the love of God and with the spirit of sacrifice and dedication to the faith of the saints and martyrs of history by Roman Catholics, who are men and women of prayer and all that that implies and includes, by Roman Catholics, who know their religion and are able to explain it when the occasion arises, by Roman Catholics, who know, too, the enemies of the Church, masonry, communism, modernism, and so on, by Roman Catholics, who, by the grace of God, are ready and willing to go out into the highways and byways to proclaim and to defend and to fight for their faith in every morally lawful way at their disposal. And especially would I stress this last, how exceedingly imperative is the need today for zealous, apostolic, crusading, militant Roman Catholics. We have a moral obligation to be such by virtue of the faith which we possess, and unless we are, we cannot possibly stem and reverse the satanic tide that ever more threatens to engulf this nation and the world. But where, pray tell, are such Catholics to be found? Please God, a number of them are right here in this room. Catholic men for Christ the King. The intellectual and spiritual and moral program offered to you by the Vexilla Regis Association is admittedly a rather demanding one which calls for discipline, conviction, and courage on your part. It definitely is not a program for lukewarm, for the lukewarm weaklings, the faint-hearted. In the sacrament of confirmation, we receive the grace to become and to be strong and perfect Christians and soldiers of Jesus Christ. By the grace of God, then, we have, to, we have the means to be just that, exemplary Christians and warriors on behalf of the greatest, the most noble, the most sublime cause in all the world, the cause of none other than the Son of God and his mystical body, the Roman Catholic Church. The challenge before us is indeed a gigantic one, and we are so small in number. But we will, please God, compensate for our present scarcity in numbers by the character, the caliber, the quality of our lives, and the intensity of our commitment. 
It is my hope and prayer, and I will do my part to bring it about, that the members of the Vexilla Rages Association will become the elite, the vanguard, the shock troops in the army of Christ the King. Without question, we do indeed live in a time of paramount crisis for the church, a crisis which elicits the most profound sentiments of sorrow and anguish on the part of all sincere Catholics who are aware of the nature and scope of the tragedy that has befallen the mystical body of Christ. But while such sentiments are perfectly normal and understandable in the present situation, we should not, we must not allow them for one moment to tempt us to despair or to lose heart, because this surely is not the will of God. Rather, let us look upon this crisis, which today so gravely afflicts our beloved Church, as a glorious opportunity at our disposal to test our loyalty to Christ and the strength of our dedication to the faith. A clear-cut challenge to us to be the soldiers of Christ which we are called to be and which the sacrament of confirmation gives us the grace to be. Indeed, is not our position in the Church at the present time, in a very real sense, a singular blessing from God, an extraordinary honor for each of us, that the Almighty has seen fit to use us as his instruments in, for the preservation of the faith in these days of darkness. How very fortunate we are that by the grace of God, not only have we individually retained the fullness of the faith, but we are divinely favored to be in a special way its custodians and defenders at this most crucial period of the church's life. Is not this, I ask, an honor and a privilege of surpassing worth for which we should be ever so grateful to God? Far from becoming depressed or despondent then, and despite the most, cr the most trying circumstances, let us have or cultivate a sense of truly Christian joy in the realization of the supremely noble and sublime nature of the glorious cause we espouse. A joy such as that of the apostles who, in the words of Holy Scripture, rejoiced, rejoice, mind you, rejoice, mind you, that they were accounted worthy to suffer reproach for the name of Jesus. And so, with a firm reliance upon the guidance and protection of the Immaculate Mother of God, let us with renewed determination resolve both to live our faith ever more fully in the days and weeks and months ahead and vigorously and perseveringly to fight in every morally lawful way we can the satanic enemies of our beloved church who are today crucifying Christ in his mystical body. Indeed, as Catholic men for Christ the King, may the grace and the strength and the courage be ours not only to live our faith unwaveringly but if need be to die in its defense and in testimony to its eternal truth. But whatever be the manner of our death, may each and every one of us be able at that supreme moment to say in all truth, in the words of St. Paul, I have fought the good fight, I have completed the course, I have kept the faith. Persevering by the grace of God in loyalty and fidelity to our beloved church unto the end, may we one day be found worthy to hear those glorious words of welcome from the lips of our divine master, well done, good and faithful servant, come, possess you the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world.